Hello, and welcome to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast. Every week, Talking Heads will bring you in-depth insight and analysis through the lens of sustainability on the topics that matter to investors. In this episode, we'll be discussing investing in listed real estate. I'm Daniel Morris, Chief Market Strategist, and I'm delighted to be joined this week by Portfolio Managers Anne Fradval and Claire Mayu. Thanks to both of you for joining me. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Daniel. Hi. It's certainly been a challenging year. A lot of volatility, interestingly, not just in equities, but also in fixed income. If we look at the returns of most asset classes year to date, well, number one, we observe it's negative. Uh, and number two, quite different than the pattern we had last year or even over the previous years. Uh, and now, of course, we ask ourselves what the pattern will be like for the rest of the year. And unfortunately, it's quite easy to come up with a list of the challenges, the headwinds uh, that we face. We, of course, have still high inflation, though hopefully falling from here, but nonetheless likely to remain at absolutely elevated levels for a while. In that context, a reaction from the central banks, uh, rates already having gone up in the U.S., starting soon in the eurozone, and of course, plenty of geopolitical concerns. Uh, in Europe for now, and then, uh, I guess, pretty much to everyone's dismay, a resurgence of COVID uh, in China, the lockdowns that are following from that, and then the sustained pressure on inflation, on supply chain bottlenecks, and so on. So a challenging time uh, to be thinking about asset allocation. Now, when we think particularly about equities, and again, it's it's been a challenging year, and then particularly real estate, I think a lot of investors probably conflate the two to some degree and, and really just see listed real estate REITs as you know, some variation uh, on a plain vanilla equity investment. So, Claire, I'm going to start off with you. What's your opinion of that? How far does listed real estate differentiate itself from plain vanilla equity? I think listed real estate is indeed an equity class, but it really differs from other by a sense. What we call REITs in the markets or real estate investment trust, they have a regulatory requirement to distribute a large part of their cash flow. In Europe, it's something like more than 80, 90 percent cash flow that should be distributed. So as a result, the stock performance of uh, real estate is much more linked to uh, rental income than to capital gains. And if you look at it on the very long term, for example, on European equities, you can estimate that uh, over the last 30 years, about 60% of the total return of the equity comes from income and only 40% from capital gains. The share income rise to more than 80% for real estate companies versus 20% of uh, capital gains. So that's very an interesting feature of this asset class, which can be seen as quite defensive in that way. So it benefits from this steady dividend buffer, I would say, and uh, it makes it very attractive from a diversification point of view in an asset allocation. If you look at the performances of REITs, uh, obviously in the short run, they are quite correlated with equity market. Let's say about 75% correlation uh, if you look at it over one year. But this correlation strongly decreases when the holding period increasing. And if you look at it on a five-year horizon, for example, you see that the correlation with equity market is only uh, something like 20, 25%. And the point that is even more interesting say, is that um, it goes the other way around when you look at the correlation with the direct real estate investments. It's very low in the short run over uh, one year, something like 25% as well. But in the long run, you've got a stronger correlation with the direct real estate investment. Listed real estate is, um, in that way, a very good proxy for uh, direct real estate investment and with, obviously, a much better liquidity. You can trade uh, uh, listed real estate stock on a day-to-day basis, which is not the case of uh, real estate investment. And a last point I would like to mention in that, uh, in spite of the uh, great financial crisis, in spite of the COVID crisis that have really hurt REITs, it provides a very, very good uh, risk-adjusted return over the long run and much better adjusted return than all other equity asset classes. can estimate them at around 10% a year. So for all this reason, I think 
uh, investor, private, institutional, should definitely hold listed real estate stock as part of the strategic allocation. Now, I mentioned a lot of our investors perked up when you mentioned that listed real estate can help with portfolio diversification in particular, uh, can be seen as a defensive allocation given the returns that we've had uh, in markets so far this year. And clearly, a lot of that has been driven by high inflation and, and rising rates. So in that context, how do you see listed real estate behaving? Listed real estate behave quite uh, well in a rising inflation context. And the primary reason for that is that the majority of leases in uh, continental Europe benefits from indexation of rents. For example, in Italy, in France, in Netherlands, rents are all CPI indexed. In Germany, it's slightly different, but in the long run, there can be a length with inflation after a certain hurdle. So there is a direct contagion effect of inflation through uh, price indices on the rents and so on the real estate cash flows. So on dividend, you can uh, you can get on the market. A second element to note is that the strong rise in uh, raw material prices and the construction labor cost creates important bottlenecks on the supply of new buildings. So um, new construction should be limited in the short run and very concentrated on high quality projects. So this allows real estate investment trusts to increase rents, taking into account the imbalances between supply and demand on certain segments, so which is also a positive effect of inflation on the REITs. On the flip side, REITs are leveraged companies. So that means that stronger interest rates can be a source of worries for investors uh, because they negatively impact costs. So what you must keep in mind is that uh, as other leverage areas of the market, what is important is not nominal rates, but real rates. So it's really what matters. And if nominal rates have strongly risen in the recent period, real rates remain negative in Europe. The average financing period for this kind of companies is five years. And on a five-year uh, horizon, real rates remain negative and there is room remaining before rates get less attractive and get to zero at least. So um, obviously this is a, a support for uh, real estate companies, but you must keep in mind if at some point this support disappears, if real rates become positive, that could be a negative uh, influence on the, on the sector. But this is not our base scenario. We've been discussing with you, Claire, up to now, some of the short-term challenges that risk assets face and how listed real estate uh, reacts in this environment. And maybe if I could turn to you to talk a little bit more about some structural challenges. Okay, thank you, Daniel. So first of all, uh, let's focus on European listed real estate. In fact, if players were still very much focusing on office and retail assets in the past, Attractive spreads associated with the banning REITs taxation have incited new segments to come to the market over the last years. The so-called niche segments that represented less than 10% of the APRA Europe index 10 years ago now represent more than 52%. The biggest one is residential with 27%, including student housing. Then you've got industrial logistics with 13% then healthcare, self-storage, and hotels. So the consequence is that members of the EPRA Europe Index surged by more than 35% since 2009, from 79 to 107 companies. To come back to your question, as an equity investor, you can now diversify your equity exposure from most defensive, such as healthcare, to most cyclical, such as retail players. And some segments have very different triggers, allowing stock picking in an actively managed equity portfolio. For example, it has been demonstrated that students are staying longer at universities when unemployment is growing, this being a positive factor for student housing players. On the opposite, increasing unemployment is a drag for office demand and retail consumption. Healthcare, at least if we speak about retirement homes, is not driven by GDP growth, but by the structural worldwide trend of aging population. And if we speak about the self-storage, this new niche has been increasing its market share over the last two years as the COVID-19 crisis has had a positive impact on demand, 
both because more space was needed at home to reallocate to work from home and because of increasing warehousing space demand from e-commerce starts up. The new interest for niche segments doesn't mean that office and retail are dead, despite the two respective threats of work from home and e-commerce we just spoke about. First for office, it will accelerate bipolarization between prime and secondary assets. It is now very well established that even if corporate tenants are going to reduce their demand for space, they are going to favor well-located, modern and flexible buildings to re-attract their employees from work from home. Those buildings will generate better rental growth, lower vacancy and therefore higher valuation. Retail is another issue because it is obvious that e-commerce is here to stay. And even if the segment has rebounded in 2022 in line with value stocks, we are still very cautious because of the potential impacts from inflation. The big issue is how far owners are going to be able or not to pass on indexation to tenants and what is going to be the impact on private consumption. And another thing that, of course, we have in mind when we're looking at our investments is the ESG angle. I'm curious how far increasing ESG regulation is impacting the supply and demand balance for real estate and, in particular, investors' interest in the sector. If we focus on the E factor, which is the most important one of the sector, we have to remember that for a long time, United Nations have been warning that buildings from construction to operation and then destruction were the biggest contributors to CO2 emissions worldwide. The Paris Agreement goal of limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees centigrade has accelerated the tenants' demand for green building that will be both much more energy efficient and flexible. In real estate, decarbonization can be achieved at three levels, reducing energy consumption, decarbonizing the power supply, and addressing building materials carbon footprint. Considering the size of the installed park, huge capex are needed to progressively comply with European and national regulation, such as net zero carbon or energy performance certificates. Only companies with the best quality of assets and strong financial capabilities will be able to do so. That's why I strongly believe that the office sector can still be attractive for investors as far as they are selecting players with prime assets and or a committed and financially secured renovation pipeline. But currently the limit is not the sky, but in fact the cost of capital. So to conclude, I'm convinced the ESG regulation, even if requiring time and money to implement, should be value enhancing for the listed real estate sector in the long run. If I can summarize a couple of the points that you've both shared with us, Claire, you pointed out that yes, there is at times, or at least in the short term, a high correlation between listed real estate and equities, but over the medium to long term, that correlation declines and fundamentally, the reason for that is that REITs have to distribute a large share of their profits to investors, and that means ultimately their correlation is with the real estate market itself as opposed to equities more broadly. And from that point of view, listed real estate then can improve the diversification of a portfolio and in this environment can also be seen as defensive. Another key advantage is that listed real estate can offer a hedge against inflation, something certainly that's on all our minds. And particularly in Europe, rents often are indexed to CPI, and so rents go up as inflation does, and therefore REACH should benefit from that. On the headwind side, we discussed the impact of COVID on demand for office real estate and for retail. Uh, and Anne, you'd pointed out that, uh, yes, there's certainly been changes in the sector, but as always, as you would imagine, even if you do have some sectors that may be shrinking, there are other sectors that are expanding. Well, Anne, Claire, thank you very much for joining me. That's it for this week's episode of Talking Heads. If you would like more information, please reach out to your BNP Paribas Asset Management contact or check out our Investors Corner blog. 
We recommend subscribing to Talking Heads on your favorite podcast channel. You'll receive your podcast episodes every Monday afternoon. If you like the podcast, leave us a positive review and a nice rating. Just before we go, I'd like to mention that Talking Heads podcast is available on YouTube. Visit YouTube slash BNPPAM slash playlist and click on Talking Heads. You've been listening to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast with me, Daniel Morris, and Fradval and Claire Mayu. Thanks again, Anne and Claire. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. My pleasure. Please do join us next week. Until then, take care. This podcast presentation includes a discussion on current market events and is not intended as investment advice or an offer of products or services by BMP Paribas Asset Management. Please keep in mind that the information and analysis in this presentation is only current as of the publication date.